Among the most famous speeches of the late Steve Jobs ranks his graduation address at Stanford University. He himself never graduated from Stanford, you probably realize, but in the summer of 2005, Stanford asked their most famous college dropout to address those leaving. Quote, when I was 17, I read a quote which went something like this, if you live each day as if it was your last, someday you will most certainly be right. Death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. Death is the single most important change agent in this life. And as you know, six years later, at the age of 56, Jobs was dead. One very simple lesson that the author of Genesis 5 wants us to get hold of is this. You are going to die. Over the next eight weeks, our subject on Sunday evenings is something all of us loves to talk about. We're going to be considering ourselves. And what we're looking at is not mere anthropology, that is the study of humanity in isolation, without reference to external explanation. That much is clear from verse 1 of chapter 5 of Genesis. When God created Adam, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. He blessed them and named them Adam, man, when they were created, when Adam had lived and so forth uh, and so on. In other words, it was God who made us. And so rather than looking at humanity in the way that the anthropologist does in the faculty in our strange modern universities, We're going to be looking at God's verdict on us humans in his syllabus of what I'm going to call key stage one primary school. After all, this is just chapter five of the book of Genesis. And throughout these chapters, chapter five through chapter 11, this key stage one material, throughout the chapters, the author wants us to get hold of one key point, and that is this, that without external aid, We humans are simply unable to help ourselves. That is, our prospects are profoundly limited. Uh, We can't make for ourselves an eternal existence. We can't make a great name for ourselves. We can't even improve ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. Now, it's gonna take eight or nine weeks, this series. I'm delighted we've got that long. Because really what I'm hoping that Genesis chapter 5 through 11 will do for us is what God intends for it, I believe, to drive a great stake, that is a wooden pole, into our understanding to which we anchor ourselves, a stake of reality about the world, about ourselves. And it seems to me that um, it's an enormously important wake-up call to us in our, and I say our in the broadest possible sense, of course, but in our generation, your generation, okay, Uh, because whether through science and technology or politics and sociology or medicine and psychotherapy, you know, we come from an age in the last 60 years or so, all of us, that have been told over and over and over again that we we can help ourselves. The, The confidence of modern humanity in its own ability to save itself beggars belief as you look at the events that go on in our newspapers day after day and particularly in the last 24 hours. And when I say our generation, actually when you ponder it, it's as old as the houses. I believe this material was written uh, for a a first audience who are traveling out of Egypt and to the promised land. And it seems to me the author wanted us to realize this lesson, you cannot help yourself. And if anything, Genesis 5 through 11 teaches us that, that there needs to be some supernatural aid from outside if there's going to be any hope for humanity. And I have been praying and I will be praying week by week by week, that this truth lodges in our heads so that we don't live in this world as deluded beings. And if we don't get it, we don't realize that, we think we can make a great name for ourselves, we think we can save ourselves, we will, all of our life, find ourselves deluded. 
So, so much for our introduction, and the br brutal lesson of chapter 5 is meant to lead us to a vital decision, and we'll come to the vital decision at the end of the talk, but the brutal lesson is inescapable, and you can see it there in verse 5, verse 8, verse 11, 14, 17, 20, 27, 31. Okay, if you're taking notes, good luck. Okay, so verse 5, look at the end of verse 5, and he died. Verse 8, look at the end of verse 8, and he died. Verse 11, look at the end of the verse, and he died. Verse 14, and he died. Verse 17, and he died. Verse 20, and he died. Verse 27, and he died. Verse 31. Even the geographers like myself can get that, can't we? It's nice and simple. You are going to die. Now, this is the first book of the Bible. This is key stage one. This is among the most foundational lessons that God wants us to get hold of. Before we get into any detail, let me tackle one of the questions that I expect many of us will have been asking. What about the longevity, that is the length which these people live? Adam, after he fathered Seth, verse 4, lived 800 years. He died at 930. Seth, when he'd fathered Enosh, lived 807 years. He died at 912. Hey, what's with the numbers? I thought my granddad was old, but this is ridiculous. Now, close study of the text shows us that it cannot be, as I had always thought until I looked at it closely, that the author of Genesis in his day calculated the length of years differently to us. For if Adam really only lived to a hundred, and if we did the maths, as they say, then we would have to say that one year in Genesis is equivalent to nine years today. Okay, fair enough. But by the same maths, you would then have to say that father, Seth fathered Enosh at 11 and a half, Enosh fathered Kenan at 10, and Mahalalel fathered Jared at 7. Now, then you've got other problems to deal with which we needn't go into for sake of decency. <laughs> so, so that doesn't work. It might possibly be that in some cases the author is referring to the length of a person's dynasty and actually saying actually this whole sort of era lasted this long. But, and I won't go into it now, that can't be the case in the case of Noah where throughout he's talking about a specific individual and it can't be the case in the case of Enoch. Could it be that with a deterioration in humanity's DNA, so the length of life in our age has gradually decreased, 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 decreased? I think there's some suggestion of that, and we'll see that when we get to chapter 11. Here's what one writer says. If post-Enlightenment readers delight in chronological computations with a view to demonstrating the implausibility of the Genesis timescale, these interests are far removed from the intention of Genesis. The ages attributed to these men of old convey their remoteness from the writer's own age and yet their reality. In other words, these are antediluvian, these are pre-flood figures. They're back in the distant past, in the ancient mists of time. And the author wants us to learn one brutal lesson that will drive us to one vital decision. And the brutal lesson is this you are going to die. Uh, but why start our summer series on this happy topic, the futility of human effort and endeavor, why start our summer series in chapter 5? Well, the answer is very simple, that every three, or three years or so, we look at Genesis 1 to 4, and we've done that really quite recently. And I thought it would be helpful for us then to move on a little and have a look at Genesis 5 through 11 and to consider humanity. And we frequently noted that the Genesis material is divided up around the statement, these are the generations of. So there were no chapters, there were no verses in the original text, and the author expected us to listen as sophisticated listeners. Look at chapter 5, verse 1, these are the generations of. Look at chapter 6, verse 9, these are the generations of. Look at chapter 10, verse 1, these are the generations of, chapter 11, verse 10, 11, verse 27, these are the generations of. So the author to Genesis divides up his material in blocks, and each block has a major subject, and they build block on block on block on block, and our responsibility as attentive 
thoughtful listeners is to say, well, what is the author trying to teach us in this block? So block one, chapter one through to two, verse four, is God created everything by speaking. He is the creator. Block two, chapter two, verse four, these are the generations of, through to the end of chapter four, humanity rebelled against God and God in judgment passed his verdict on our world. And now chapter five, verse one. Let me tell you about humanity. Let's talk about you, says the author. You, You wanna know a thing or two about yourself? These are the generations of Adam. So do you see what the author of Genesis has done? It's not as people who I really should have known better when I was at college studying in a liberal theological college, they used to say, oh, well, there were loads of different authors and you know, somebody just collected this bit, this bit, this bit and stuck it all together. Now, what the author has done is he stepped right back in chapter one, there is a creator God. This is the kind of panoramic view Chapter two, four through to chapter four, humanity rebelled. This explains the world as it is. And now chapter five, verse one, let's zoom right in. Let's look at humanity, shall we? What have we got left? He died, he died. He died, he died. He died, he died. He died. These are the generations of Adam. Let me tell you about yourself you're going to die. Churches love to post provocative and stimulating advertisements on their notice boards uh, to encourage people to take what we have to say seriously, to come in and listen. And there's a church in Wimbledon, Emmanuel Wimbledon, some of you will know, perhaps some of you normally go there. You're playing truant this evening. Well, you should be back at home. Um, And I was passing that church on at least three occasions. They've been asked to take their publicity down by the local council. And I remember walking along the Ridgeway, past Ridgeway, past Emmanuel Wimbledon one day, and they had this poster up. It was kind of long and thin like this. It was black background with uh, white writing, highly stylized, sort of gothic, very kind of twirly, and you couldn't make it out to start with. You actually had to stop and read it, and you had to sort of put your head on one side slightly to see what it says, and it simply said this, you are going to die. The author of Genesis knows no such subtlety. Verse eight, he died. Verse 11, he died. Verse 14, he died. Verse 17, he died. He died. It was Robert Alton Harris who said, you may be a king or a street sweeper, but everybody dances with the grim reaper. Now, I'm very aware that uh, for some of us, this may be very acute indeed. The wounds are raw and the pain is real. Some of you know that uh, 18 months or so ago, I buried my own father. He was a tower of strength, aged 90 when he died. At 80, he was still at the top of ladders with his chainsaw, still on the roof of farm buildings, still driving in fence posts with a handheld driver at 80. In his final summer, he left the house rarely. Eventually, he was unable to move even from his own hospital bed, and there he died. From an expansive life in the army to the county of Cornwall, to a small farm, to a front room, to a hospital bed, to an oak coffin. Now, I'm sorry that this is a somewhat sobering lesson for us at the start of a new series in this summer term, and I hope you're looking forward to the rest of it. But God considers it so important for us that he places this lesson right up front, if you like, in module three of what he wants us to know. Let me tell you about humanity, says God. Let's talk about you. Were God to have a key stage one for primary school syllabus, the Ofsted inspector in God's academy would have on his inspection list, do the children realize death awaits them? Some of you work in Christian schools. Have you taught them that yet? If you haven't, then you haven't taught them a fundamental Christian truth. 
Well, a truth that every needs to take seriously. And it does suggest, doesn't it, that in our culture where we seek to contract out death from the home to the hospital or the old people's home or the Dignitas clinic, we are likely to remove ourselves from one of the most important lessons that God wants us to hold in the front of our consciousness about humanity, that following the rebellion of men and women against God, his judgment on us human beings is that we have removed from us the possibility of life. We will die. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the author Solomon says, it is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. You, you want to be wise? Consider your death. You want to know what's good to, for you? Go to the creme. In fact, when people ask me what I do for a living, I frequently reply, I prepare people for death. I find it helps the conversation focus very quickly. <laughs> and next time you are at home, you know, you've got a, you know, an away day or a home day rather, uh, or you're at a loose end or you're planning an outing with your girlfriend, why not take her to the creme? It'd be very good for you. There are five chapels in the city of London crematorium. Opening time is at nine o'clock. Already there are people in each one of the chapels by nine. And at 9.05, the gates open and the first hearse rolls in. Each service lasts no longer than 30 minutes. And as one finishes, the next is ready. Nine o'clock, 9.30. 9.30, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, 10.30. 10.30, 10 11. It's relentless. Back in the early 2000s, I asked Philip Jensen, who's one of the people, incidentally, who sent us his greetings and said he's praying for London. And my prayer is that, among other things, we will wake up to the reality that religions are not all the same. And I hope you will begin to make that clear to people. You know, Christianity is radically different from Islam. But anyway, they're, they're, that's to one side. But Philip Jensen came here, and Philip uh, is renowned for calling a spade a JCB, and, uh, which is a type of big mechanical digger, if you're not aware what JCBs are. And uh, Philip came, and uh, he spoke here on Tuesday lunchtime to the business community. If anybody thinks they can answer the problems of the world, it's the business community. And he just said, uh, you're all on the conveyor belt to death. Some of you will jump off early. Some of you will jump the queue. Others will move a few places back. But all of us, Every one of us is on that conveyor belt. Now, I was at this stage going to move straight on to the second point, uh, that this brutal lesson is designed to take us to a vital decision, and we will get there. But before we do that, I want us to notice something that I've only noticed kind of this time round as I've been looking uh, at this material. And I want us to consider that there is more to this chapter simply than the grim reality of death. So with three key exceptions, one in verse one, Adam, the other at the end of the chapter, Noah, and one which we'll look at in a moment, Enoch. This chapter, have you noticed, is kind of relentlessly monotonous? It's unimaginatively, unimaginably, unimaginably repetitive. You'd almost say it's boring. I mean, it was beautifully read for us. I can't remember who read it for us, but anyway, it was beautifully read for us. But actually, it's quite hard. It's pretty dull, isn't it? Let me, let me read verse 6. I mean, if you were writing this, GCSE is going on at the moment. Imagine the you know, 15-year-old penning their GCSE English literature lesson, their essay, and they come back full of red pen, however remarks that many remarks they asked for. Verse 6, when Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he'd fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived, and you could write the rest of the chapter, couldn't you? It's on and on and on. It's stripped bare. 
He lived, he fathered, he lived, he had other children all the days of his life, he died. He lived, he fathered, he had other children, he lived, he had all the days of his life, he died, and so forth. You know, if you were writing it, you know, wouldn't you have said, now, now let me tell you about Seth. Seth was fascinating. You know, he built a canoe. It was the first one you ever saw. And then there was Mahalalal. You know, he tried to build a round wheel, but he only got to the square. He was a bit further behind. You know, you would have put stuff like that in, wouldn't you? But the author has stripped the whole thing right down. That's all you've got. Just a bare, mundane, futile re repetition. And I'm sure that's the point. Because back in chapter 3 of Genesis... Part of God's judgment. Well, you tell me what you think. Talk about it afterwards. Why is it stripped back like this? And I wonder if it's back in chapter 3. After humanity has rebelled, God says to Adam, from dust you are taken, to dust you shall return. Your work will be futile. You won't be able to make a name for yourself. So the whole thing is stripped back. There's not even a single achievement in the whole chapter. Humanity. Death. I had lunch today with a lovely guy. He'd worked for 29 years at RBS. And six months before he got the heave-ho from RBS, you're not allowed to say that he was sacked. I mean, he was, but let's use the polite language. He was let go or whatever it was. Six months before he got the sack, uh, somebody came up to him and said, the thing about working in a place like RBS is these big institutions. You know, it's like having your arm in a big bucket of water. You lift your arm out. The water closes over. It's as if you'd never been there. He said, I was sacked six months later. Three weeks later, it was as if I'd never been there. He lived, he died. He lived, he died. He lived, he died. I mean, here's a little experiment. If you disagree with that, do you know your great-grandfather's name? Now, the tiresome thing in the last service at 4 o'clock when somebody put that, I'm like, oh, I know my great-grandfather's name. Well, what about your great-great-grandfather's name? I mean, if you go home tonight, write a thousand-word essay on your great-grandfather. I mean, do you really? What, what do you know about him? He lived and he died. I mean, what about this bloke here, the Reverend James Blencarn, A.M., whatever that means. I mean, I was thinking about the Reverend, you know, you've got all these names stuck up around. What do you actually know about them? Who cares, apart from an American coming to see their great, 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 whatever they happen to be. I mean, who cares about Blencarn? You know nothing about him. Yeah, well, actually, you can say, oh, anyway, there he is, a respected vicar of this parish, which they say about everybody, don't they? They'll probably say about that, me, that about me, but they don't know the half of it. So... <laughs> Do you see that the, the bald futility of humanity? It's ruthless, isn't it? You may be a high-end achiever. You may be part of the 0.001% like Steve Jobs, but ultimately when you're gone, the water closes over. Another 150 years. Oh, there was a bloke. He invented some funny thing you could write on. It's a quaint, antiquated thing. He used to build square wheels. Look at that. Similar sort of thing. Apple. Who remembers him? Well, now there's a happy start, isn't it, to our summer series. Uh, so is there any hope? And we're going to say so that's the title of the series is Humanity, What Hope? Is there any hope? Now, I want, you'll have to think about this yourself and talk about it afterwards. So you may feel I'm reading too much into it. Here's a thought for you to take away. In a sense, it would be enough on its own simply to learn that lesson. It would help us to wise up and get real. It would make us wiser than our contemporaries who never think about their death. But buried within this chapter, there are three characters who break the relentless repetition. Well, Adam up front... I mean, he doesn't break the relentless repetition because the relentless repetition hasn't started at this point, but you see there's Adam in verse 1. And then there's Noah at the end. The one I want us to consider at the moment is Enoch, who we find there in verse 21. See, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch lived after he had fathered Methuselah 300... No, it doesn't say that, does it? Enoch walked with God 
after he had fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years and he died? No. Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Now, one author describes these verses as shining like a single brilliant star above the earthly record of this chapter. Now, could it be, and you tell me what you think afterwards, but could it be that our author is wanting us to know that, yes, here is reality for humanity. He died, he died, he died, he died. But there does appear to be some hope. We're not told at this stage. I mean, this is only chapter 5 of Genesis. This is key stage 1. You know, we, we need to read on if we're going to discover more. But there does seem to be some hope given this individual who walked with God. Were we to read on, and we're not going to do that now, we would discover that Noah walked with God and was blameless, and that Abraham was commanded in Genesis 17 to walk with God and be blameless, and that promises are made in Genesis to the man or woman who walks with God in full obedience. Of course, nobody does. If you get to the end of the end of Genesis, you say, well, look, hope has been held out. It's been kind of dangled there in chapter 5, as if there's something beyond pure life and death. There seems to be hope. You get to the end of Genesis cha 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 chapter 50, and we haven't found the person who walks with God. In fact, you get to the end of the whole of the Old Testament, and you haven't found the person who walks with God. And then onto the scene strides the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the first major thing we read about the Lord Jesus is his encounter with Satan. If you are the Son of God, he triumphs. He walks with God. Remember earlier we were reading of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He walked with God. There is one who walks with God. And so this seed, you might say, this kind of faint whisper that we have in chapter 5 of Genesis grows and develops and comes to a kind of loud bellowing in the New Testament as we come to the Lord Jesus Christ, who walked with God and was blameless and defeated death and rose from the grave, having paid for human sin and rebellion and dealt with the problem of Genesis 3, Genesis 4, Genesis 5. Yeah, uh, there is hope but it lies in the man who walked with God. And the New Testament doesn't leave it here. Just turn to Hebrews, would you, for a moment, and I'll tell you what page it's on, page 1,211, page 1211. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 5. Because Hebrews 11, while you're getting there, extends the promise that we find in the Lord Jesus Christ to every single man and woman who walks with God. Look at verse 5. By faith, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So what does it mean for me then to walk with God? For me to walk with God is for me to draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ who worked perfectly, walked perfectly with God himself. For me to walk with God is for me to believe that God exists, to seek his favor in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, to draw near to him and walk with him. Well, here then is a vital lesson. No hope. No hope. I mean, listen to Chris Evans tomorrow morning. I know you don't listen to Radio 2. I know, you know, you're 20. But just pretend, you know, make like your mum and dad. Listen to Chris Evans. He believes in the perfection of humanity. Everything is rosy in the garden. How is he going to cope with this weekend? Most of your fellow men and women in the office, they ha are, if I may say it in the nicest possible sense, 
in terms of the reality of death, hiding. And God brings us right out into the open, if we're going to be wise, if we're going to make sense of life in this world, we've got to face the reality of death. And then having realized the reality of death, ah, there is hope beyond if we will walk with God. What does it mean to walk with God? Oh, to draw near to the one who really did walk with God, the Lord Jesus Christ, daily, hourly, regularly, to walk with him. Do you know, I love speaking about Enoch, because Enoch is such a reminder, isn't he, to us, of what it means to be authentically Christian. It means to walk with Jesus Christ, to walk with God day by day, week by week, month by month, you, you don't have to come to church to walk with God. I mean, it helps, we're encouraged, we're strengthened. But actually you walk with God They're out there in the classroom tomorrow. You walk with God as you draw near to God on Wednesday morning in your office. You walk with God when you're out with your party, without, without your mates in the nightclub later on in the week, whatever it happens to be. You walk with God as you draw near to the Lord Jesus Christ. And here is an encouragement to us, right at the outset, whatever our circumstances, whatever situations we're facing, to walk with God, to take the brutal reality, to learn the vital lesson, to draw near to him, and to walk with him. Let me lead us in prayer. We do thank you, our Father in heaven, that you are such a wonderful teacher. You don't hide truth from us, that you're loving enough to confront us with reality. We pray that you would graciously protect us from walking through life with our head in the sand and pretending things are not as they self-evidently are. We pray that you would take this truth and confront us with it day by day through this week and help us to share it with our others. And then we pray that you would enable us to draw near to you, to walk with you, to believe that you exist as we look at the Lord Jesus Christ, to draw near to him and to walk with him. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.